Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, delighted to see you here this morning. Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson of the Aspen Institute, uh, and it's my pleasure to both join you in what will be a fascinating discussion, but to introduce. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson, Executive Vice President of the Aspen Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here today uh, and also to, uh, uh, to benefit from what will be a fascinating conversation with uh, two really remarkable young people. Uh, Eric Liu, I'm proud to say we recruited to start a new program here at the Institute, one of our now more than 30 policy programs. Uh, focused on uh, citizenship and American identity. Uh, not surprisingly, great interest that he has developed through his uh, wonderful writing and increasing uh, uh, presence as a commentator in both uh, popular uh, media as well as, as uh, scholarly uh, journals. Uh, has an article he told me just uh, this morning that's soon to come out in, in the journal Democracy on, on some of his ideas. Uh, this program, uh, we launched it last summer and he's already doing things domestically and internationally relating to uh, the critical need to create a more engaged citizenry and improve the functioning of our democracy. Uh, Akhil Amar is really a leading, if not the leading, constitutional scholar of his generation, and maybe we'll say someday other generations as well. Uh, he's the Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science, uh, one of those people who uh, can teach both brilliantly uh, in a law school, but importantly also to undergraduates as well. Uh, his work uh, ranges all across uh, the Constitution, constitutional theory, and American government, uh, and he's written extensively. Uh, he really needs no introduction to people like those in this room, uh, and he now has a wonderful new book uh, that I hope you will purchase if you haven't already, uh, The Law of the Land, A Grand Tour of Our Constitutional Republic, which is really a geographical and intellectual road trip uh, of the United <laughs> States. Uh, absolutely fascinating from you know, Massachusetts to Alabama, uh, Wyoming, Ohio, California, and probably many of your own states as well. Uh, with that, I'm simply going to turn things over to Eric. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elliot. Um, uh, it is really exciting to have all of you here today and uh, exciting to, to have this program uh, under the auspices of this new uh, program on citizenship and American identity. I just want to begin uh, by expressing my uh, excitement uh, about being part of the Aspen Institute family and uh, uh, having gatherings like this and conversations like this, but uh, even more broadly, really connecting some of the ideas of the type that we're going to hear in this conversation today uh, to a broader national conversation that's unfolding as we speak about who we are as a country, both demographically and civically, uh, and how in this time of incredible flux and change, technological, demographic, political, and economic, we sustain a coherent and common uh, sense of shared destiny, shared history, uh, and shared responsibility. Uh, and I'm not sure there's a better person on earth uh, to uh, help uh, get a conversation like that going than uh, uh, the man to my left, uh, Sterling Professor at Yale, as you heard Elliot say, uh, but I often re refer to Akhil Lamar as my brother from another mother. Because uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, we are on the same wavelength and in sync, uh, uh, both children of immigrants and uh, lovers of uh, this country, but also uh, of what you might think of as the civic religion uh, of this country, a, a set of ideals, a creed uh, embedded in the origins of this, uh, of this country, uh, a set of ideals that we have never as a country, in fact, fully delivered upon, never, in fact, actually lived up to. Uh, and yet it is that striving to close that gap between ideals and institutions uh, that has led people like me and Akhil uh, to do the work that we do, but has also led people like me and Akhil to be uh, such peas in a pod and uh, close friends and collaborators. This book, uh, The Law of the Land, um, uh, which, as Elliot mentioned, uh, uh, will be available after our program for signing uh, and for further conversation. I want to thank our friends at Politics and Prose uh, for setting up shop here and being with us this afternoon. Uh, this book, I, I, I have to tell you, uh, is a delight to read, not only because it is, as Elliot uh, uh, said, this grand 
uh, tour of our country, uh, seeing different states of the union through a constitutional lens, uh, but also because uh, it is on the page uh, a capturing of what you're about to experience in the flesh, uh, which is the exuberance, the erudition, uh, the passion uh, that Akil has for all things constitutional and American, and his ability to translate things that are often very technical and abstruse uh, into terms that uh, everyday Americans can really uh, not just relate to, but get rather excited about. Um, uh, the one thing that I want to say, Akil, before asking you just to introduce the book in a sense and tell us a bit about it um, is maybe to tee that up by simply noting that uh, Akil is the author of many books uh, uh, about the Constitution uh, and many of them aimed uh, for a general public but this one is unique in that it has this kind of conceit of the road trip uh, baked into it and uh, that wasn't just because Akil wanted to hit the road with his family uh, though I know there were many good stories uh, of some of those road trips uh, 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 part of that, but, uh, uh, but also because there is a worldview that Akil brings to this work on the Constitution that is about place, that is about geography, uh, that is about remembering that the United States is not just a big um, homogenous agglomeration bound together by national brands like McDonald's and uh, so forth and Starbucks, but is actually uh, a set of different subcultures uh, that have yielded different kinds of traditions and yielded different kinds of takes on our constitutional and creedal inheritance. And so, uh, you know, Akil, I want to invite you to describe this book uh, in a way uh, with that as sort of the setup, kind of why it was that you felt it was important to highlight um, this geographic dimension uh, of our American identity. Thanks, Eric. It's such a pleasure to be with you and with my, back with my friends, Eric and, and, and Elliot. So a couple of things. Uh, ours is a federal republic. Uh, states remain uh, as very important constituent elements, building blocks of our system. Um, if it were its own nation, California would rank among the great powers of, of the world. I, um, I would say ahead of France, the, the French would um, <laughs> beg to differ. Um, uh, but when I, as a kid growing up in California, when I did look up at that periodic table of elements, I did see Californium and Berkeleyum and Laurentium and Einsteinium. Um, um, and they would, of course, mention uh, the Curies but, um, and wine. Uh, but almost everything, there is an American exceptionalist story, and you see it when you look at the 50 state constitutions um, alongside the federal, because in all sorts of ways, actually, Americans do things differently. Almost everything in the federal constitution actually had a state constitutional antecedent. States had written constitutions first. They had uh, three branches of government and bicameralism in every state except Pennsylvania and uh, Georgia at, at the founding. They had judicial review established at the state level even before federal judicial review came along. They had jury trials. They had bills of rights, which made the absence of a federal bill of rights so immediately obvious to the folks who were asked to ratify the thing. They said, dudes, you forgot the rights because they know what, knew what a constitution was supposed to look like because they had state constitutions. States got rid of some, some of them slavery first. States, many of them gave women the vote first. Um, and, um, so just think about how in the world, not everyone, the great democracies of the world, they don't have, all have written constitutions, they don't all have bicameralism, they don't have, all have separation of power systems in which uh, the, the executive branch is elected independently of the legislature, many of them are parliamentary systems. All 50 of ours, you see, are presidential systems with governors looking a lot like presidents, uh, four-year terms in 48 of the 50 states, veto pens, pardon pens, you know, the rest of the world doesn't have necessarily the great democracies, jury trial or two parties, uh, single member districts, first past the post. So there actually is an American system um, and, and I wanted the reader to sort of see the states as building blocks and antecedents of the federal system. And there's also variation. Um, states do things differently. Some have initiative and referendum, others don't. There's a geographic uh, variation. This is a, a book not just about states, but about regions. And it's conventional to divide America into, I would say, four regions. And, and within each, two subregions. There's the Northeast, there's the South, there's the Midwest, there's the West. Within that, 
Within the, the Northeast, there's New England and the Mid-Atlantic. There's the Upper South and the, the Deep South. There's the, the Old Northwest and the Trans-Mississippi Plains. Um, and there are the Rocky Mountains and the, and the Far West, um, the Pacific Rim. And in bringing the states and the regions into the picture, the other thing I was trying to do is to remind us that, that America's Constitution is an ongoing project. It begins at the founding. It doesn't end there at all. Uh, because when you talk about Illinois, for example, well, now you're talking about Abraham Lincoln and the Reconstruction and the, and the, uh, the 1860s, which give us so much of our Constitution. When you talk about Wyoming, which is a still later addition to our national family, well, actually, Wyoming is the place where women got the vote first. And so now we're, we're starting to get into a, a spectacular um, uh, 20th century constitutional developments like uh, women's suffrage, which, to repeat, began first at the state level. So in trying to tell the story of, of the different states and regions, I also am trying to um, bring um, later generations, founding mothers as well as founding fathers, um, blacks alongside whites, into our constitutional story as authors of the ongoing constitutional project in a way that we might miss if we focus only um, on um, the Philadelphia story, the, the founding story. One of, one of the things that you just alluded to in mentioning actually Illinois and uh, Wyoming, you know, th there are several states in particular that you describe in the book that uh, I want to go a little deeper on, but let, let's actually start with Illinois uh, and Lincoln. Good. Uh, because uh, if there is such a thing as civic religion in the See, United yeah. States, yeah, you got, I, I the, have my Lincoln. got the Lincoln, Lincoln tie. tie. Um, uh, a lot of this is about uh, uh, secular worship at the altar of Abe, mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and I think one of the things that is uh, that you said in passing, and you but you you go at length in talking about in this book, um, is this idea of the reconstructed Constitution, right? The Fourteenth Amendment in particular, but of course the Thirteenth Amendment, which uh, outlawed slavery. Uh, but so much of the 14th Amendment and its promise of both equal citizenship and equal protection um, uh, under the law, um, you can think about these in grand constitutional abstract national terms, but a lot of what you write about here is how this work, Lincoln's story, is rooted in the place of Illinois. Yes. Um, say some more about that. So Eric mentioned, and I think Eric and I feel this particularly as uh, children of, of immigrants. Um, and when you read um, this handout that you all have in, in, in front of you, there's um, a, a, a recognition um, uh, that um, uh, um, how do we sustain this so a coherent national identity given that we Americans are not connected by blood? Uh, by ethnicity, by by nation, by national um, origin, um, even by language, uh, necessarily, what we are connected by is a, a creed, a story. How do we find ourselves in that story and um, a certain civic religion? Yes, what we Americans have in common is the Constitution. Um, it is George Washington but also Abe Lincoln. You see, we are all children of Lincoln, it seems to me. Lincoln himself tells this story about how ours is a nation unusual in the world, dedicated to a proposition. We actually, there are certain beliefs that we have. This is the American creed, and Lincoln redefines that American creed. You see, because the founder system, great though they were, failed. We call that failure the civil War. Some people still call it the War of Northern Aggression. We still aren't quite over it yet, um, or the recent unpleasantness. But um, <laughs> but it was a it was a house divide, and they feel that very deeply down south. The past isn't dead; it's not even past. And when you lose a war, you remember it more vividly than when you win one. Um, and the house that the founders built was a house proverbially divided against itself. It was built on an uneven foundation of slavery, and it fell. And we today all live in the renovated house, the reconstructed house that Lincoln and his generation 
uh, rebuilt, a 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. That's when the word equal gets put in referring to individuals rather than states in the Senate. Uh, the founders were interested in equal states in the Senate, but the Lincoln's generation is interested in equal people, people born equal, people created equal, black and white, Jew and Gentile, male and female, I would say gay or straight, and we're having a conversation right now about the meaning of that, that idea of equality. These are Lincoln's generation's themes, and my claim is, um, and what you call, the, every today, everyone today believes in the Bill of Rights. So think just for five seconds about the important Bill of Rights cases, whether you agree with them or not, that pop into your head. And I bet almost every one of them is not a Bill of Rights case. You're thinking about, because the Bill of Rights originally limited only the federal government. Congress shall make no law of a certain sort in the First Amendment. And the Tenth Amendment ended that. And, and it's about local militias and local major, um, uh, juries and, and skepticism of the f central government. But your Bill of Rights today, MAP versus Ohio. Connecticut, uh, Griswold versus Connecticut, New York Times versus Sullivan's Alabama, Roe Gideon. versus Gideon versus Wainwright is Florida, Roe versus Wade is Texas, um, Lawrence versus Texas, um, uh, and, and on and on and on, and that's a 14th Amendment vision. Now, how did that vision come about? Now, so explain that to, to lay folks about the ways in which um, these cases, these paradigmatic Bill of Rights cases, uh, which are rooted, in fact, in state law, what, what about that makes them 14th Amendment? stories. When Lincoln dies, he, he, get, he signs a 13th Amendment. Um, it's not ratified yet. It is given to him. He's the Moses of our people. It is given to him to see the promised land, but not quite to enter it. That's the movie Lincoln. So, so he signs this 13th Amendment. Uh, and it will lead, upon ratification, immediately to a 14th Amendment, which will codify Lincoln's vision, even though he's in the ground. Um, uh, this is, um, uh, and the first sentence of the 14th Amendment says, everyone born in America is born a citizen. That is born an equal citizen. We are all born equal. We're all created equal. That's his riff on Jefferson, who said it but didn't live it and, and, and do it. But Lincoln has a reinterpretation. That first sentence says, we're all born equal equal, full and equal citizens with rights. And then the second sentence says, here's specifically what that means. Um, St. Paul um, in the Gospels, uh, uh, in the, the letters says, I am a Roman citizen. What it means to be a citizen is to have certain rights. And the second sentence says, rights not just against the federal government, but against states and localities. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Fundamental things like free speech, free press, free exercise of religion, a right to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures. These, which are things in the Bill of Rights, which originally applied only against the federal government, now, thanks to Lincoln's amendment, the 14th Amendment, apply against states and localities. And all the cases that you think about as Bill of Rights cases, almost all of them, strictly speaking, are 14th Amendment cases. You have to give Lincoln and his generation um, the credit for this. And then you ask me, how does the Midwest factor into all that, and I'll just, I'll tell you in just a, a sentence how, how I think it does, but, but just to remind you, almost everything that you think is really important about the Bill of Rights is strictly speaking not the legacy of the founders of, the, of James Madison and George Washington and their generation, but of Lincoln's. Now, why was Lincoln's generation so, uh, why was Lincoln sort of so emphatic um, in his vision and how was it shaped by where he's from? Eric and I um, are, I think we probably see ourselves, um, Elliot and I were just talking about this too, as probably Americans first. Um, we, we, Eric, you, you spend time in Seattle, but you also spend time in, in, in New York, um, where you grew up, and, and, and you're here in Washington, D.C., and I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I grew up in California, and then I went to school in Connecticut, and, and, uh, um, and I, I, I teach in, in, uh, um, regularly in New York. Now, if you're Robert E. Lee, you're a Virginian all the way down for many generations. The Lees have been running Virginia from the 1620s on, and of course Virginia comes first for you. Um, and if you're a Texan, maybe it's a, it was a Lone Star Republic on it, its own, six flags, its own unique identity. But Abraham Jade Lincoln- Jade Helm is all I have to say about that. <laughs> um, but Abraham Lincoln, he's born in Kentucky, 
His father's from Virginia. His grandfather's from Pennsylvania. Before that, he thinks they're from New England, although he's not quite sure which state. Moves to Indiana and then Illinois. And when he moves to Indiana, you see, Indiana is just a federal territory. It's part of the United States in the same way that DC is, but it's not yet a state. In Lincoln's vision, the Union actually helps give birth to the states. This is, could never be Robert E. Lee's vision. Virginia came first. What are you talking about, Abe? The, uh, the, but but if, you're, if you're from the Midwest, the Union is actually creating these new states, ex nihilo, sort of out of the wilderness, and um, promising good land surveys, which mean that actually you can keep the land that you farmed, but which because um, uh, the Northwest Ordinance has good land surveys. Kentucky didn't, and that's why the Lincoln family had to leave. They were working the land, but the, they, they didn't quite have clear title to it because Virginia didn't have good land surveys. You believe in freedom against slavery. The Northwest Ordinance, which is older than the Constitution, says this territory will always be free, no slavery here. And word for word for word, the 13th Amendment is borrowed from the Northwest Ordinance. The Northwest Ordinance has a commitment to public education. So does Lincoln. He uh, signs into law the Moral Land Grant Act. Lincoln is very much into national infrastructure. We were talking about Amtrak just a few minutes ago. During the middle of a great civil war, he needs to connect uh, he's trying to connect America east and west with the Transcontinental Railroad, Transcontinental Railroad, as he's trying to hold the nation together north and south. Um, and that's because if you're in the Midwest, you need railroads and canals to connect you to the rest of America, to the world. You can't, if you're from Illinois, there's no way you're going to allow the South to secede unilaterally for two reasons. And he says both of these very clearly. He says, there's no defensible border between the culture of corn and the culture of cotton. You know, we can't build a wall, and, and we don't want the, uh, people right to our south. If you've been to the Great Plains, it's just all flat, um, um, being able to sort of threaten us, because there's, there's no great wall of China. There's no Alps. There's, there's no Pacific Ocean uh, uh, protecting us. And second. Everything from the Appalachians to the Rockies drains through one mighty river, the Mississippi, um, whose port is New Orleans. You cannot allow a foreign power to sort of have a chokehold um, on you to, to block off your access to all the markets of the world. Your whole way of life depends on floating stuff down that river, corn or distilling it into, into liquor and um, floating it down in barrels. So it's a very Midwestern view of the world about freedom and no slavery, about the relationship of the union to the states, um, about the impermissibility of secession, about the importance of transportation and infrastructure and public education. Um, it's a very Midwestern vision. You know, this is, uh, 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 this is why I love Akil. There, there's just uh, he, pretty much any topic you want to throw at him in an encyclopedic fashion, uh, he, he can be equally exuberant about. Uh, uh, but one I want to pick up on that you mentioned at the outset, you spoke about how Wyoming was the state that first uh, uh, enacted women's suffrage. Um, the section in this book about Wyoming focuses less on that uh, and more on uh, a really provocative and interesting uh, understanding uh, that you express of the Second Amendment, uh, of our right to bear arms, uh, and ways in which, uh, um, you know, when you think about a state like Wyoming, uh, yields a certain uh, world view about the role of guns and about the role of citizens and uh, you're not pulling out a gun are you no, <laughs> yeah. no. But the pen is mightier than the sword yes so, uh, and so I, I'm very interested to hear um, you describe uh, for folks here um, uh, the Wyoming chapter great uh, so here's a specific illustration, too, in fact. And if you want to see it more clearly, um, if you just go on the, the web and put in my name in the Second Amendment and maybe Ezra Klein, he had a piece in the Washington Post about this. I claim that almost everything that, um, much of what we actually give the founders credit for actually is more rightly the legacy of Lincoln's generation. I said what we call the Bill of Rights. It's not even called the Bill of Rights, you see, in the document. We call it the Bill of Rights because Lincoln's generation called it Bill of Rights because a man named John Bingham of Ohio uh, introduced an amendment. We call it the 14th Amendment, quote, in support of the proposed amendment to enforce the Bill of Rights because it doesn't call itself the Bill of Rights. And the Supreme Court never called it the Bill of Rights before Reconstruction came along. Now, originally, that Second Amendment 
it was a kind of localist amendment to importance, an anti-federalist Tea Party um, anxious, anxiety about a strong central government. They just fought a revolution against a strong imperial government the Americans had. And so it's about Lexington and Concord and Bunkers Hill and local militias. And the picture that I want to show you of that, which hangs um, about 200, about 300 yards from my office at Yale, although there's another replica just right down the road here, is by Jonathan Trumbull. It's the Battle of Bunker Hill. You've all seen it from your American history textbooks, and it's all about local militias against the Kingsmen. This is a very famous, you'll see it in the Capitol building, and the other version of it is in the Yale University Art Gallery. Okay, so that's arms bearing at the founding, that's the original Second Amendment. It's very anti-federalist skepticism about the federal government. Congress shall make no law of certain sorts in the First Amendment, but, but states can do what they like, perhaps. That's the Second Amendment vision. After the Civil War, that gets reinterpreted, reimagined, because now, actually, the states have misbehaved because of slavery and other things. We need a new birth of freedom, to borrow a phrase, a second Bill of Rights, a Bill of Rights against the periphery, against the states. And they're not so keen. Lincoln and his allies, um, Ulysses S. Grant, William Tecumseh Sherman, John Bingham, all from Ohio, from the Midwest, you see, just as Lincoln is, and uh, Grant also is partly from Illinois. Um, so they're not so keen on these local militias anymore. Local militias were the heroes of the American Revolution, but the, the villains, to some extent, um, of the Civil War. The, the heroes of the Civil War, militarily speaking, are the, the boys in blue, Grant's army, um, U, US, um, United States, grant. Um, now, they believe, though, that states are bound by the Second Amendment, but they reinterpret the Second Amendment. They believe that individuals have to have guns in their homes, not in, as a militia, because if they don't, actually, especially black individuals, local cops won't protect them when the Klan comes calling. The founder's vision, when guns are outlawed, only the king's men will have guns. Reconstruction vision, when guns are outlawed, only Klansmen will have guns. This is a different picture. This is from, actually, the 1860s. It's from Harper's Weekly. It's called the Freedmen's Bureau. And if you look carefully at these pictures, um, which you can do, um, Ezra Klein has a little piece about this, the history of the, of the Second Amendment in two pictures, you'll see it's a pun on the first one. The flag of the central government is in the middle. There's one black person in the corner of the original screen, but there are many black people in the, the later um, uh, thing from Harper's Weekly. The Freedmen's Bureau was all about having, uh, making sure that individual blacks would have guns in their private homes to protect their homes against um, uh, white thugs, um, hooded riders. And let me tell you one final thing. So, so to really, uh, the National Rifle Association is founded after the Civil War by a group of ex-Union Army officers. It's much more of actually a reconstruction organization, although it's forgotten its own history. As have we all, we tend to give way too much credit to the founders and not enough to Lincoln's generation. One final point. Suppose everything I just said you disagree with, fine. <laughs> so the Second Amendment isn't about individual right, Professor. Even if it isn't, there are unenumerated rights in our Constitution, the Ninth Amendment says. So where do we find them? We liberals believe in privacy. You know, we believe in sex in the, in the home, um, free from government intrusion. Conservatives believe in guns in the home. Um, you know, I say give them both what they want. This is America, and here's... <laughs> Um, and it would be a civil libertarian nightmare to try to root guns out of people's homes, uh, given that there are almost as many guns as people. This is about interpreting the American story. So here's a point. Almost every state constitution today has a right to have a gun in the home for self-protection. And state constitutions are sources of proper interpretation when we're seeking unenumerated rights. So even if you didn't believe the Reconstruction story, I believe you, you should attend to state constitutions because in so many ways they help define the federal experience. You know, what is so fascinating about what Akil has just unpacked here is it, it scrambles the categories that people have of how to think about, say, the Second Amendment, right? Um, the, the progressive, uh, the, the layman's pro progressive interpretation emphasizes um, it's all about a militia. Uh, and so, um, you know, the right to bear arms uh, shouldn't extend to an individual right to have guns at home. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's overinterpreted by today's NRA and today's gun lobby uh, in this extreme way. But what's fascinating about what Akil has just said is that you can take a view rooted in Lincolnian progressivism mm -hmm. um, to understand that, in fact, 
uh, for reasons that had to do with the protection of a, a recently freed and, and recently enslaved uh, minority um, that you can quite believe in that individual and, and, uh, right and, to bear And arms. two more things. I am trying to, this, this is what we have in common. This is our creed. I'm a liberal. I actually don't have a gun in my home for self-protection. The guns scare me, and I, I think my, it's m a gun in my home might be more likely to, to injure a, um, a, a, a friend or loved one. Uh, but this is not a, a Mars constitution that I'm trying to explicate. I'm trying to explicate America's constitution, what we all have in common, and I want to reach out to conservatives, for example, and say, well, we liberals believe in, in unenumerated rights, privacy, Griswold, and we want you to join us in that. So, but what's turn around is, is fair play. We have to take seriously your claims of, of, of un, un, unenumerated rights, and we believe in the 14th Amendment, so should you. It's actually a little bit more complicated than you might have thought. But, but come on, uh, join us in our, um, uh, yes, our civic, a religious um, um, worshiping at the altar of Lincoln. <laughs> you know, you used to be the party of Lincoln. Come on back. So one of the things that is also uh, fascinating about this book, um, in addition to this geographical uh, lens uh, that allows you to see different things in new dimension, um, is and you're already hearing it. This this uh, great kind of distilling historical lens that uh, Akil applies to uh, so much uh, of the Constitution, and you know. I, I, a running theme throughout, of course, you've already talked about it, is um, not just federalism, but debates over the meaning and significance of federalism. Uh, and uh, there, there's a chapter in here about New Jersey uh, and about Lord Camden, uh, uh, after whom the city of Camden, uh, and for that matter, Camden Yards uh, uh, in Baltimore uh, is named. Uh, and I'd love for you, Akil, just to um, help unspool for us um, the story and the debates about federalism uh, as they originate uh, in, um, in New Jersey? So um, the most famous cases of the founding era uh, arose in London, see, because um, Americans are colonists and they're focusing on the imperial city and, and um, what's going on there. And uh, there are these two very famous cases called Wilkes versus Wood and Entick versus Carrington. The judge is the great Lord Camden, as in Camden, Maine, Camden, South Carolina, Camden, New Jersey, Camden Yards, where the Orioles play. The plaintiff in one of these cases is a man named John Wilkes, as in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, Wilkes County, North Carolina, Wilkes County, Georgia. Alas, John Wilkes Booth, who was a very famous man at the time, like the Brad Pitt of his, of his, no, he, he, he's a very famous family, so that's why he's kind of like, you know, Brad Pitt and An Angelina Jolie there, there are the Red Graves or um, um, uh, the Barry Moores. So, so he, John Wilkes Booth is named for John Wilkes. Ashley Wilkes is an allusion in Gone with the Wind to Wilkes. So these are, and Americans are, see, you can just look, see at a map, look at a map and you see, actually, they're paying attention to Wilkes and Camden. Um, and Camden is this great civil libertarian who holds against the crown, which has authorized all sorts of unreasonable searches and seizures. And Camden basically, with the um, aid of local, of, of, of juries in England, allows people, John Wilkes and others, to sue the government for massive punitive damages because the government has unreasonably searched and seized. We get the very idea of punitive damages in Anglo-American law from these cases. We get an early version of what we'll call the Seventh Amendment, the right of, of uh, uh, civil juries um, uh, from these cases. We get what we call the Fourth Amendment um, from these cases. But in America, there's a, an interesting little twist or wrinkle because um, there was no exclusionary rule to enforce the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth, Fourth Amendment was essentially about innocent people being rousted by the government. And if you're and innocent... Again, for lay people, exclusionary rule meaning... Exclusionary rule basically is, well, if they find evidence that you're guilty of something, they can't use it in a criminal prosecution. But suppose you're innocent. And suppose they know you're innocent, but they just want to go after you because you're black because uh, you're a minority religion, because you're an outspoken critic of the government. Well, if the exclusionary rule was all the protection we had, it'd be open season on innocent people, and they could beat you up and do all sorts of things, because that doesn't lead to any evidence beating you up, strip searching you in front of, of, of your family or your, your neighbors. So, so the framers believed in damages, 
um, uh, to keep government officials who uh, uh, acted outrageously, unreasonably, um, in check. Uh, and in America, um, here's the interesting federalism twist to all of that. So what happens if the federal government unreasonably surges and seizes? You sue them in trespass, in effect. Um, they've, they've, they've committed a trespass upon your person in tort law. Um, but what law is it that first gets you into court, even against the federal government? It's actually state law. It's state trespass law, state property law, in the same way that if the government grabs your property um, and just uses it to build a dam or a fort or a road, and you want to bring a suit for uh, just compensation, eminent domain, even though you're suing the federal government, it's actually state law that gets you into court. So just right, I, I don't know my, my actually which way I should be pointing, but Robert E. Lee's estate, we now know it as Arlington National Cemetery. Here's the story of it. During the Civil War, the federal government passes this law that um, uh, everyone has to pay um, taxes in person for their property. And Robert E. Lee is otherwise occupied, so he does not want to walk into the national capital and pay the tax. So his friends pay it on his behalf. The federal government refuses the, the tender, saying, well, that's not in compliance with the law. And so they foreclose on the property for failure to pay um, proper taxes. They buy the thing at um, uh, the auction. No one else is bidding on it. And they buy our, uh, uh, the, the, the plantation for a few pennies on the dollar. Eventually, Lee's family sues um, to get just compensation. And they actually win. Um, but, they, but it's state property law that actually enables them to bring that lawsuit. Now, at the end of the day, they decide they don't really want the property because in the meantime, the union government has put a few bodies in there that kind of ruin the ambiance, uh, so, so to speak. Um, but it's state law that in interesting ways, going all the way back to Camden, can sometimes protect us against um, federal um, unconstitutionality. Camden himself didn't sort of understand all that because in England there is no federalism. But in, when you take Camden's ideas and apply them to America, you get some very interesting libertarian possibilities of using states' rights to protect individual rights in ways that both left and right might find interesting. So um, I, I want to pose a final question to you here and then begin to open this up for uh, wider Q&A and conversation. Um, uh, you uh, alluded earlier to the Philadelphia story, that interpretation of both the Constitution and our country's origins, um, and uh, whether in talking about Amtrak and the ways in which the Northeast Corridor has been shut down by the tragedies of this week, um, there are all these ways in which so much of the constitutional conversation ends up being centered uh, around the Northeast Corridor. Uh, and uh, one measure of that uh, uh, that you unpack in this book is the ways in which uh, the Supreme Court of the United States itself uh, has evolved from an institution where um, people came not only from different walks of life and different kinds of life experiences, but truly embodying the spirit and the attitudes of different parts of this country um, in ways that uh, you've already been describing here. Uh, but rather that we have a court today um, that is essentially, wherever uh, justices may have been born, um, a court really of people who have been formed by elite institutions uh, between New York and Boston. Right. Um, maybe between Washington and Boston. But, uh, um, and that there is this kind of... Between New Haven and Boston. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not two, to put two, too fine a point two, on it. Two, <laughs> two law schools. They all went to two, one of two law schools. Um, and, you know, you write early on in the book about uh, one of uh, your heroes, uh, Justice Robert Jackson, um, uh, you know, in the chapter, I believe, on New York. And uh, say a word about this trend and about the consequences for both the court and the country uh, when uh, this central national institution, um, which can and should be embodying the geographic and attitudinal diversity of the country, uh, is so formed by a set of narrow elite institutions uh, um, in a narrow geography. Yeah. And I benefit from this because I teach at Yale Law School where three of the justices um, graduated and also at 
Columbia and Harvard uh, as, vi as a visiting professor where the other justices attended. So it's good for me if they all have to go to one of these two or three <laughs> schools, but it's not good for America um, because there is a broader diversity in, uh, in the land that I think would be good to uh, be reflected on the court. Um, they all tend to have been uh, sitting federal appellate judges, except for Elena Kagan, um, at the time of their appointment, and she was Solicitor General, which is like being a judge. Um, no senators, no governors, um, um, uh, no um, attorneys general. Um, none of them, in fact, has even been elected uh, um, mayor um, or vice mayor um, to think of, uh, of Justice Stewart, for example. But um, the court that gave you Brown versus the Board of Education, only one of them had been a, a, a federal judge before being a justice. Governor Earl Warren, Senator Hugo Black, Attorney General Robert Jackson, Professor Felix Frankfurter, SEC Chair Bill Douglas. They represented a diversity of career paths. Um, um, before that, there was a geographic diversity built into the Supreme Court because Supreme Court justices rode circuit. And so they had to come from the different parts of the country because a big part of their job was actually um, not just sitting at the Supreme Court, but holding court in, in their um, home region. And so that was struck, built into the very structure of the earlier court in ways that it's um, not today. Just two or three points about geography today, as we talked about geography at the founding or um, in Lincoln's era, and um, maybe then. Um, so I mentioned Abe Lincoln, um, his, for the presidency, so we still pick president state by state, uh, and it actually matters what the distribution is, but the states have a, a, actually, they're not divided big versus small. Not, there's almost been not, never in American history have the big states been on one side and the small on the other. Big states have almost nothing in common. New York, uh, Florida, Texas, California. Small states have almost nothing in common. Rhode Island, Delaware, Wyoming. America is divided coast against the center and north against the south. Pretty much always has been. Every state that voted for Lincoln pretty much voted for another tall, skinny constitutional lawyer from Illinois um, named Obama. Every state that pretty much voted against Lincoln pretty much voted against uh, Obama. There are only two or three that have flipped, one of which is Virginia, because actually um, uh, Washington, D.C. has sort of uh, uh, penetrated um, out um, beyond the beltway into, into Virginia, uh, its culture and, and, and ethos. So um, it's north against south, um, uh, coast against the center, uh, the one um, justice on the Supreme Court who's a, the, the, the parties have flipped. The, the Democrats uh, have inherited Lincoln's geographic coalition. The Republicans have become the party of the former Confederacy. The one justice on today's court coming uh, from the, um, the Republican side who most gets it on same-sex marriage is the guy from Northern California. You see, Tony Kennedy, where we get it on same-sex marriage. Who, where does he grow up? In Sacramento, in the shadow of whom? Earl Warren, who was then governor of the state, a Republican, a Lincoln Republican. There used to be such uh, in, in American politics. And Tony Kennedy is sort of looking up to Earl Warren. Earl Warren spends time in the Kennedy household. Um, Kennedy is half Earl Warren, kind of half Ronald Reagan, uh, so, and you see two great Republican California governors, and you see even in a generation the difference between a Warren um, um, and a Reagan. So um, the, the other big thing that you've mentioned is we've, over 20 years, gone to a world where we have a much more sort of elite training for our leadership. Um, Abe Lincoln had less than a year's formal education in his life, not higher education, all in, and he was Abraham freaking Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest lawyer America has ever produced. Hugo Black, who is my hero, who actually vindicated many of the themes that Lincoln believed in, who came uh, from the Southland, a former Klansman from Alabama. He was, didn't have a fancy educational background. He kind of um, didn't have three years of law school, for example, and he didn't have the standard four years of college. Robert Jackson went from high school to he skipped college, one year of law school, and he apprenticed, basically. And these were very great figures, all underestimated by others who had fancier educational credentials, Lincoln, um, Black, Jackson. And today, they all went to fancy schools, undergrad. They went to very fancy um, law schools, and not just the justices, OK? Of your last four presidents, how many have gone to Harvard or Yale? And the answer is four. 
Of uh, the last seven runners up, how many went to Harvard or Yale? The answer is five. Um, of the last 28 presidential elections, ever, all the way going back to Teddy Roosevelt in um, uh, 1904, um, uh, in 20 of the last 28, um, either the president or the guy whom he beat, you know, the, the runner up, went to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, or Columbia. 20 of the last 28 presidential elections. So, um, and there's a geographic pattern there, given that many of our great educational institutions happen to be a disproportionate number uh, on the Amtrak corridor. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I want to open this up. And we don't talk about that. I mean, you know, that's, and that's interesting. Uh, for a wider conversation, but just to pull on one little thread you alluded to there, I mean, the, the diversity of different kinds, both, um, life experience uh, uh, on the court, uh, geographic diversity, uh, calls to mind as well, um, you know, one of our great uh, uh, retired but living justices, uh, Justice O'Connor, um, who's so involved in different ways with the Aspen Institute as well, um, had a dimension to her life, which frankly most people aren't all that aware of, which was she was a politician and a darned good one yep. uh, in Arizona. Uh, she was a, a Senate majority leader in the Arizona Senate um, and uh, so much of her worldview, uh, you know, she's kind of an embodiment and a case study of a lot of the themes that you're describing here uh, as a child of the West, uh, but also uh, a woman who had to navigate uh, a political, a state political system uh, where there were very few women uh, and navigate one where uh, she had to kind of build bridges and fashion new ways of getting things done um, uh, that would mark progress but not... Uh, um, uh, 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 upset the uh, greater majority power structure. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, s every one of the themes that you've been describing here, um, we can apply to uh, other figures mm -hmm. and other cases and other people and other uh, uh, situations in the news and in our political life today. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of want to use that as a segue to uh, open up uh, for questions here, um, either in response to things that Akil has said or things that uh, um, you've just been dying to, to ask uh, Akil Amar. You had your hand up first, sir. <clears throat> and uh, I press that button uh, so we can hear you. Yeah. Yes, my name's Joel Hetker. Uh, question, why was New Jersey the only state to have slavery in 1860, north of really the Mason-Dixon line? Um, so uh, New Jersey is the only state in the north that Lincoln loses twice. Um, I went down to Princeton two weeks ago as part of this book tour and t took snippets of this book and, and called it, just because I knew it would draw a crowd, the Constitution goes to Princeton. Um, but I actually showed them a t-shirt that a friend of mine that, um, uh, uh, made for me. And it's orange and black, which are Princeton's colors. Um, and it says Madison 71. He was class of 1771. And, but then when I flip it around, it says University of Northern Virginia, which is my nickname for Princeton. Princeton is very, New Jersey has always been very Southern. Um, the Virginians used to go get themselves educated. Princeton Woodrow Wilson is another example of that. So within the Ivy League, you see, you're talking to you know three Yale people here, you know, and, and Princeton is very, uh, uh, so um, slavery, exists in almost every state at the founding, except for maybe, there's almost none, it's just vestigial in New Hampshire. Um, um, and Massachusetts gets rid of it in a court case in 1783, the Quack Walker case, Holmes versus Jennison, which is an antecedent of Margie Marshall's um, later, using the very same clause, all, all Massachusetts people are born free and equal. That's the clause that the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, Supreme Judicial Court, uses in 1783, a clause from 1780, State constitutions, all men are born free and equal. That's what Massachusetts says in its 1780 constitution, which will become the, the 14th Amendment. We're all born equal. We're all, the same word, born, in the 14th Amendment first sentence. We're all born equal, created equal. That's the clause that was used in 1783 to get rid of uh, slavery in Massachusetts by the Supreme Judicial Court. That's the clause that Margie Marshall used to affirm a right of same-sex marriage as a matter of state constitutional law in the Goodrich decision in 2003. So pretty amazing, the same idea. We're all born equal, well, we're born equal. Um, male, um, uh, gay and straight, male and female, uh, Jew and Gentile, black and white. 
Now, it was easy to get rid of slavery in Massachusetts because there wasn't that much of it, and in New Hampshire because there wasn't that much of it. It was harder in places where slavery actually still wasn't so big, but it took Connecticut 40 years to get rid of it gradually. New Jersey had slavery on the eve of the American uh, the Civil War, as, as you mentioned. Um, New York had slavery. New York in 1820 has as many slaves, New York and New Jersey, as Georgia, I think. Um, um, uh, um, so, um, um, and and, and in, in the, when Jefferson wins the South and Adams wins the North in 1800, New York is the swing state. It's the Ohio. It's where North meets South. And it's a slave jurisdiction, you see, at the time. So here's why. Because it's really hard to uproot evil when it connects with vested um, um, interests. Economic interests. Um, so here's how slavery is gotten rid of in almost all the states. In a word, gradually. Here are the laws that states passed. States did get rid of slavery first, but m in a very gradualist system that ended up achieving abolition but not emancipation. Abolition ends slavery as a system. Emancipation frees slaves. The two are different. I could emancipate people without f getting rid of slavery, emancipation without abolition. I could abolish slavery without freeing individual slaves. That's what states did. Here's how they did it. They passed laws in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Connecticut, and elsewhere in effect saying, anyone born after July 4th of, of this coming year, um, born to a slave mother, everyone now a slave dies a slave. Everyone born to a slave mother after July 4th of this year will be an indentured servant for the first 25 or 30 years of his or her life and free thereafter. Now what that means is over the course of 80 years, eventually the slaves will die off, the indentured servants will become free and will eventually get rid of slavery, but we're giving the capitalists, the slaveholders, 95 cents on the dollar. The present discounted value the arc today, we, uh, because we, are fall we live in a fallen world, so um, today evil triumphs, but eventually you know, we have to reach the promised land. We have to have a North Star. We eventually get rid of slavery, and New Jersey takes a very long time about it. It had more slavery because it's more southern. It's closer to Delaware. Um, <clears throat> there, there's a phrase you remind me of, uh, Akil, which um, recurs over and over again in Lincoln's arguments, long before he was president. Uh, uh, it, it is littered throughout the Lincoln-Douglas debates, uh, you know, but this phrase, ultimate extinction, right? The idea that the, 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 the work of that era was to put slavery on a path uh, toward ultimate extinction. And Lincoln's argument itself was that even the founders and framers of the Constitution had that in mind. So abashed and embarrassed uh, were they about the existence of slavery, they couldn't utter the word slavery in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was one of the pieces of evidence he used to say that even those who accepted the compromises within the Charter believed in a path of ultimate extinction. Right. Um, and that, uh, th that reality, uh, you know, and the gradualism that is uh, embedded in it, um, uh, you know, in our live moment right now, um, you can see the politics of those who are satisfied and those who are dissatisfied with incrementalism. Um, that the fact that an arc bends ultimately and eternally toward justice um, says little about what's happening today in West Baltimore, what's happening uh, today. In his, his critics called him a compromiser. He's a realist. He's a lawyer. He believes in private property. He is a Republican, after all. And, um, and so, thesis, slavery is wrong. He actually, here's what he says, slavery is wrong. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember a time I did not think so. Slavery is wrong, thesis. Antithesis, our entire way of life depends on foreign oil. I mean, um, on, on slavery. <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, okay. Um, thesis, it's wrong. Our way of life depends on it. Synthesis, we must get rid of this in time. We are moral creatures. We have to first get straight in our heads if it's wrong. If it is wrong, we have to do something about it, but um, it, maybe we can't get rid of it immediately, but we, let's agree the slave, and, and the framers thought of it, many of them this way, but by the time of the 1850s, slavery had become much, much worse. The cancer had, had expanded, and slaveholders, many of them were proud, um, d defiant, um, aggressive slaveholders. But the founding generation, many of them, they were like people who smoke, who are addicted, they know it's bad, they can't quit, but they don't want their kids to start. Um, and the culture of tobacco is actually the same culture of strip mining, is actually the culture of carbon. So foreign oil is not a ridiculous analogy when you actually understand certain things that are bad for the earth and bad for the soul. 
Um, and, uh, um, and so there actually are connections, and the solution is time. We first have to, we are moral creatures. We have to get straight in our minds whether it's, it's it, there's no morality of it, then if there's no morality of it, then uh, Kansas can do whatever it wants, Stephen Douglas. But if there is morality, we have to eventually get ourselves on the right side of God. Let's take the uh, next question. You had your hand up. Oh, thanks, Mr. Luke. Uh, before I begin, uh, Professor Amar, you are a, a, I probably shouldn't use this term, but you're badass. Thank you for the MOOC. So I guess this oh, thank you. Oh, wow. The massive uh, open online course that's free to the world. You can, you can watch it for Guinness, free. Guinness, Sam Adams, and your class were like the, the tops of my summer last year. So wow, thank, thank you, you very, very much. And thank you. That's a pretty good company. Um, having buttered you up, I have four questions. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. Um, I got my pencil. Okay. With all uh, apologies to uh, to well, David Letterman, I, I leave you to just one though, because there's so, a, well, so pick just the best really one. the best, pick your best one. one. Uh, okay. And, and I'll right. stick around afterwards and answer okay, them all. Okay. Right, well, that's cool. That's cool. Um, uh, I call the the Bill of Rights my top ten. Uh, with all uh, uh, apologies to David Letterman. So could you look at that as being the sword and shield of civil rights? Mr. Lou mentioned. Um, uh, Wainwright, uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, Korematsu, mm -hmm. uh, Map Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, Ernesto Miranda, Arizona. Mm -hmm. So could you give us a survey of those? And, and if I could possibly sneak in a second question, <laughs> um, could you look at the enduring a president's enduring legacy uh, for his court uh, nominees? Thank Great. you. Great. So <coughs> just uh, Miranda er involves Arizona. Gideon involves Florida. Um, so um, just to take your question and just remind all of you, what we call the Bill of Rights really isn't, in fact, the Bill of Rights. It's really the 14th Amendment. It's Lincoln's Amendment, because in our history, states really have misbehaved. Um, and that was clear to Lincoln's generation because of slavery. Um, even, you know, uh, New Jersey had, had misbehaved. and and. Um, northern states, and so we need this new birth of freedom. And there has been a regional pattern. Hugo Black is from the Southland. He's from Alabama. And he understands that rights violations have been particularly egregious in the South. By the time Gideon versus Wainwright is decided, the great case that says even if you're indigent, you get government counsel, you, you, you get appointed counsel, because you might be innocent and you need a lawyer to, um, to make your case in court because very few people who aren't lawyers can actually defend themselves properly and you might be innocent. Um, that was an idea that 45 of the 50 states were already following by the time of Gideon versus Wainwright. There were only five states that weren't and they were all in the former Confederacy. The four of the first five states that seceded a, ye a century before were four of these five and um, Black understood all of this. Much of what the Warren Court did was, in effect, bringing the Southland um, up to national standards, bringing the Southland sort of back into the, the Union, um, taking the outlier states and bringing them um, up to, um, uh, which is why I said, Every state, almost every state, has a right to. That, I just said a liberal thing about um, uh, indigent defendants needing needing counsel. I'll counterbalance it with a conservative reminder that almost every state has a right to have a gun in the home for self protection. And if we're going, if I can get, get, count up states in support of Gideon, I think other folks get to count up states in, in support of of gun rights. Um, on presidents and their legacy. Um, Two th quick things. Um, uh, one, I think our, na our stories thus far have tended to overemphasize court cases. Courts are important, but many of the most important constitutional decisions have been made by presidents. Um, most of you were taught that Marbury versus Madison is the most important constitutional de decision. It barely makes my top 10, and it's not the most important constitutional decision of 1803. <laughs> uh, it doesn't involve liberty, and the America um, isn't, wouldn't have been that much different without it. There was judicial review be established before Marbury, after Marbury. The next time the US Supreme Court strikes down an act of Congress is Dred Scott in 1857, 50 years later, and Dred Scott is made up. I mean, it's preposterous. So what is the most important constitutional decision of 1803? It's called the Louisiana Purchase, and a president made, and it doubles America's land mass, and it assures that America is actually going to survive as a nation. Um, uh, and what are the most important constitutional decisions of all time? I claim, 
They were made by Mr. Lincoln. He resists unilateral secession by, um, and, and, and if he doesn't do that, maybe there's no America. It's like imagining, who would you be without Lincoln? It's like imagining who you'd be if your parents had never been born. He's what we have in common. He's, he's our, our, our creed, our civil religion. Um, um, when he emancipates the slaves with a stroke of an executive pen for reasons we've been talking about, that's gonna lead to his uh, eventually the battlefield victory, his reelection on an anti-slavery platform in 1864, his Joling and arm twisting that you saw in the movie Lincoln, ratification of the 13th Amendment, which is going to lead to the 14th and the 15th. That's your world. That gives us what we call the Bill of Rights, and that's actually what we call judicial review. Judicial review is all basically 14th Amendment stuff, not founding stuff. It's all Lincoln. So chapter one of this book begins not with the founding, not with the Bill of Rights, but with Lincoln. We all live, I say, in the house of Lincoln. Um, uh, Proverbially, he's our daddy. Um, and, um, and when we bring Lincoln to the picture, we're going beyond the founding generation and looking at a different part of the country. Yes, sir. Thank you. Larry Checo. Um, the more I learn about our history, the more I realize what a miracle America is. Yeah. And um, I'm worried about the fragility of that America right now, um, especially since we're doing a better job educating consumers than we are our citizens, which I think is a really big tragedy. Um, I guess, you know, the Constitution is sort of the underpinning of everything. But my concern is more towards our institutions, which are supposed to defend our Constitution. And I'm just worried about where they are now. I mean, even starting with the Supreme Court, uh, talking about corporations being people, I've gone back to, the, I've gone back to the uh, Constitution, and nowhere in there have I seen the word corporation or companies. So, um, should we be as worried about our institutions right now as we are about the Constitution? Thank you. Great question, Larry. Uh, um, I agree with much of it. I'm more of an optimist. Most importantly, I agree that we have to educate not just consumers, but citizens. We need institutions like the Aspen Institute. Um, there's an, another organization that I'd love for you to know about called Citizens University. This man is basically the founder of that and it's all about civic education as is his partnership here with Aspen Institute. So um, that's right, that's what these MOOCs are about. The, uh, a MOOC is an acronym for a massive open online class. The, um, I've taken my various um, uh, courses and distilled them and my books and distilled them into a whole series of a free online lectures, kind of like Khan Academy, you know, it does for me. And, and they're just for people to watch. Now here's why, I'm, um, um, and that's all part of civic education, because the Constitution doesn't enforce itself. You know, it's up to us, we, the people of every generation, which is why I need to keep reminding you that Lincoln's generation was faithful. Um, it, the, the project didn't end in 1787. Um, well, without woman suffrage, see, that's the 20th century. That's a, ma that's a big constitutional decision, you know, as, whereas Marbury versus Madison, original versus appellate jurisdiction, who cares? And I've written a whole article about it, and I teach it for two weeks every year, and I don't care that much, <laughs> you, you know. But, but the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, you know, uh, and, and women's suffrage, without women's suffrage, you know, it's President Mitt Romney. It makes a difference. He won among the men. He lost among the women. It, it, uh, it's, um, uh, there's no um, Obamacare wins for two among the male justices on the court, it, you know, they're the three female justices with the difference. And you could call it Pelosi care, by the way. I wouldn't object if you did, because um, women are uh, more emphatic about a social welfare system. Um, uh, that's part of the gender gap. So here's why I'm more optimistic um, than you are. A couple of things, and then I'll say word on Citizens United. One, so we have to replenish it, and every generation has. Um, in our lifetime, we got rid of poll tax disenfranchisement and let 18-year-olds vote. Um, and there was women's suffrage, and there was Lincoln's generation. So yes, we have to renew that every generation, and that starts with understanding the constitutional story, the creed, what we all have in common. And so, you know, preaching to the choir on that, absolutely. Now, I'm more optimistic, one, because in the world, we're winning. At, the time, at 1786, there was democracy almost nowhere on the planet. 
almost nowhere. Britain, a little bit, although they have uh, an unelected monarch and a, a hereditary house of lords. A little bit in Switzerland, but no one lives there. There's no banks, commerce <laughs> um, there. They're, they're more sheep than there are people, and there's nothing you know, worth tempting uh, an invader. That's it for self-government in the planet in 1786. And thus it had almost always been in all of recorded history, almost no democracy, and where it did exist, tiny little city-states rather than extended geographic spaces. That's 1786. Today it's over half the planet by land mass and population. When my parents are born, India, um, um, it's controlled by um, um, unelected British um, overlords, just like America in the, in the 1760s. And now, it's a billion people, an entire subcontinent. Massive religious and ethnic and linguistic diversity governing themselves with free and fair elections and a written constitution and judicial review and, and um, uh, 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 alternating um, um, uh, uh, parties in, in power and dimension religious toleration on the American model. That's a billion people. You know, France is now a great republic, almost as great as California. Uh, it was an absolutist t um, uh, monarchy at the time of the, the, the framing. Uh, you know, all of Western Europe. In our lifetime, the wall fell Eastern Europe. We won the last century, are like our odds in, in the future. One of the reasons our world is more complicated is we're competing against ourselves in, in all sorts of ways because other people have borrowed the American model and thank goodness for that. That's because of the success of the American constitutional project and we can't we can't forget that. So, so that one, that's one of the reasons I'm more optimistic. Second, yes, we're deeply polarized today. So were we in the 1850s and 60s. Um, every single member of uh, the opposition party voted against, in Congress, voted against the 14th Amendment. Every single one, and every single Republican except one voted for it. It was every bit as much 100% polarization as um, with Obamacare, for example. Um, Lincoln gets not a single popular vote south of Virginia not just electoral vote, popular vote. It's, it was sort of deeply divided. In the 1850s, um, North and South were voting for different people for president. That hadn't happened before, and then it didn't happen since. You know, Jimmy Carter wins in the South, and so does Bill Clinton, but it's happened again. So, so, but this too will pass, okay? So we're going through a polarizing phase, but a polarizing phase gave us the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. We, we, there are such phases in American history. It gave us a Civil War too. Um, <laughs> but, but we made lemonade when we got these lemons, and, um, and we can do so again. Um, and polarization um, is, uh, um, uh, I think, actually transitional, um, for reasons we could go into afterwards, on Citizens United. I actually defend Citizens United in my chapter on Tony Kennedy, um, a great friend of the Aspen Institute, I should add. Um, and here's why. Because um, uh, the New York Times is a corporation, and I wouldn't want the government to be able to shut it down, or Random House. Um, is Aspen Institute a corporation? Um, um, and so is Yale University. And even if you could shut down corporations, there are wealthy individuals like Soros or the Koch brothers. So, um, and I don't want, I want to limit campaign contributions because those can be corrupting. But independent expenditures, if people just want to say, I like Hillary, I hate Hillary, those have no effect unless actually voters are persuaded. So what we actually really need is voter education so that they'll be less vulnerable to 30-second sound bites. Um, we should pay people to go to school to learn about the issues in election a month before the election, just like we pay them to do jury service. So we, we could, we, we, but, but Mitt Romney may have had more money, but Barack Obama won, and Meg Whitman may have had more money, um, but Jerry Brown won, and in my state, uh, this woman, she was a worldwide wrestling person, she had more money, and actually, she, she didn't win. Here's one campaign finance reform uh, that we actually have. It's called one person, one vote, secret ballot, and corporations don't vote on election day. Now, the trick is, and the real campaign finance reform would be an educated citizenry, going back to your first point, and there are ways we can do that. Um. I'm gonna, uh, actually, um, let me bring in some folks who've been uh, sitting uh, in the back here. Yes, you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Arslan Malik, uh, Professor Amar. Uh, the question I have is Alexander Hamilton. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about 
the granddaddy for us all is Lincoln, but it, I see a lot of Hamilton in Lincoln. Y you're right. And there so is I, a lot. I wanted you to comment on that, especially yep. given his story and background. And yes. So forth. Poor and boys made good, born into dirt, believe in um, uh, nationalism, um, in, in, in unifying national projects, infrastructure projects, both anti-slavery. Um, um, and, and this tradition, you see some parts of it in, in Teddy Roosevelt, you see some parts of it in Dwight Eisenhower, um, who gives us a, you know, an, um, a, a road, an, an interstate road system um, that builds on railroads and Hamilton's plans. Yep, so there, there are similarities. That was just one comment, but the, the question I have was also completely different. Native Americans, uh, how did Lincoln view them and how did that shape the the, uh, the 14th Amendment and the 13th Amendment, if at all. Wh which Americans? Na Native Americans. Uh, they're the losers in, in important respects in our national story. Um, I'm not reaching for a gun, uh, <laughs> but this other um, book that I wrote, America's Constitution, a biography, this feather can be understood as a quill, um, an uh, allusion to the parchment constitution, um, but it also can be understood as a somewhat elegiacal reference to the Native Americans who were the big losers in this project. Um, the, the, their land. Um, n now, um, so when these Native American cultures really want to um, uh, stay, sort of um, maintain their own sort of cultural autonomy and integrity, that's just a culture clash and they become American Bantustans and little Indian reservations now. Um, the assimilationist project, okay, you can become citizens just like everyone else in America, like other immigrants. That has tended to be, I think, the dominant trend in the 20th century. Um, and I, I'm going to, I have to admit, I have not done sufficient justice to the Native American part of the, the story in the books thus far, that my next book, I hope, will feature them in much greater detail. Because I, I don't think I've actually done justice to them, nor has America. Great. Um, question over here. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Daniel Corcor. I work at Fairvote. Um, oh, so great. I, <laughs> thanks. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about how you were saying that the Constitution isn't stagnant. It should develop with time. And we work on some reforms that have, have shown challenging to that idea. So um, one is national popular vote. So not changing the electoral system, but changing that we use nas uh, the national popular vote to elect president. And people think that that's changing the Constitution, which it wouldn't be, but the thought of it potentially altering it is scary and people don't want to do it. Um, and the other is adding a constitutional right to vote in um, the U.S. Constitution. Great. And that also is just like people laugh <laughs> when, when you say you want to amend the Constitution because, as we know, it's like very difficult, very rare. So Great. Um, what do you think about those kinds of barriers <coughs> Wonderful questions. How many of you have heard of the National Popular Vote uh, uh, Initiative? Um, raise your hand. So it's this very interesting idea, I think. Um, right now, each state under the Constitution, each state legislature can decide how the electoral votes will be allocated. In theory, a state legislature could, could pick uh, the electors itself, as South Carolina did as late as 1860. All the states today basically say, no, we're going to let our citizens vote, and whoever wins the vote within our state gets the electoral votes. But the National Popular Vote Initiative says, actually, states can choose, state legislatures, to give their electoral votes to the person who wins the national vote. Um, now, why would any state want to do that unilaterally? Pay no attention to Pennsylvania. We are only, we're going to give our electoral votes to the person who wins the national vote, so don't even bother you know, campaigning here. Well, Pennsylvania doesn't want to do that unilaterally, perhaps, but Pennsylvania might do it if a bunch of other states did it. So the National Popular Vote Initiative says um, individual states can pass this common law that says that we'll give our electoral votes to the national popular vote winner if enough other states do the same so that together we add up to 270 and are able to actually make this work. Uh, um, and a bunch of um, states have already passed these laws. Um, um, Maryland has passed uh, this law. California has passed this law. New York has passed this law. Um, so they're halfway to their target of 270. Now, it's an interesting idea. Um, do you know who invented it? John Cosa? No. No? The person who invented it is actually speaking to you. 
<laughs> um, this was co-invented 13 years ago, and I like him a lot, and he's implementing it. He's got the money and the institution, but um, the idea was generated by Robert Bennett, uh, dean at the Northwestern University School of Law, and Akhil Amar um, in a blog post that he posted on the one-year anniversary of Bush versus Gore. Um, now, um, I actually think it's an interesting idea. It's, uh, uh, there are many people who think it's harebrained, so that's why I, I um, um, uh, and I do see its flaws, but I, I do kind of like it. Uh, so thus far, only Republican, uh, excuse me, Democrat states have signed on. Eventually, Republican states are gonna need to sign on. Why might they? Here's why they might. Um, um, uh, I, I, I keep doing this show and tell, <laughs> but, um, it's th that this um, idea is discussed, the National Popular Vote Initiative, and my early blog posts on this in this book called America's Unwritten Constitution. And the last chapter is about the unfinished Constitution, the Constitution of the future. What should the Constitution of 2020 look like? 2121, 2222. And I tell you, here are three principles about what it will and should look like. One, anything that we do going forward, states are probably going to have to road test first. And they have road tested this idea because every state, I told you, has a governor who looks like a president. It's not a prime minister. They're picked independently of the legislature, but in every state, it's one person, one vote. No state has an electoral college to pick its governor. And um, in every state, you have governors who look like presidents. So this is, this is an idea that looks like the states. We, in, in California, it's one person, one vote. We count them carefully. Um, if if um, it's close, we recount them really carefully. Call us crazy, but that's how we roll in California and in Texas and in New York and in Pennsylvania. So this would be just doing this on a national level. Two, no uh, constitutional amendments should add to liberty and equality, not take away from them, because almost all the amendments thus far have done that, except prohibition, which was not a, a success. So s having an amendment saying marriage is one man, one woman, that takes away from liberty and equality. Having an amendment saying you know, marriage is two people who love each other, that adds to liberty and equality. Three, both parties are going to have to be on board, because as a practical matter, you can't get amendments unless actually you, you get buy-in by both, because um, it needs two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, three-quarters of the states. Thus far, only the Democrats have bought in. Why might the Republicans? Because they're in increasingly beginning to think that today's Electoral College might be actually tilted against them a little bit. If you look at um, how many electoral votes each party uh, in the last six elections, how many elections did the Democrats win five of the, uh, of, of, how many states did the Democrats win five of six of, of those states? How many uh, uh, states did the Republican win five times out of six? So what are the very reliably blue and red states? And, the, uh, and basically, the Democrats go into every presidential election basically having about 200 electoral votes in the bag. They only need to get to 270. The Republicans only 110. There are more pathways, perhaps, to victory for the Democrats today. Okay, we need to win Ohio or Florida, but not both. Even if we lose both, we could do it with Colorado plus Virginia plus North Carolina. Um, so, and the person who understands this as well as anyone in the world is named Karl Rove. And increasingly, the Republicans might be, enter and the Democrats believe in this because we just like equality. As a, we're idealistic that way. We just think it's a principle, equality. And <laughs> maybe we're stupid that way, but, uh, but that's what we think, equality. And the Republicans think, actually, this might be a better deal for us. So it could happen. Well, one uh, quick word on the, yeah. um, the constitutional right to vote. Yeah, and I was going to say that I, to almost all of our, um, uh, many of our amendments are declaratory. The Tenth Amendment, states' rights, it actually is codifying a principle already in the Constitution. Um, and other amendments, you might think, actually, getting rid of poll tax disfranchisement. Well, the Supreme Court later said, actually, that was an idea already implicit in the Constitution. I'm in favor of adding the words right to vote in the Constitution. I want to remind you the words right to vote already exist in five different amendments. The 14th Amendment, Section 2, the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, the 24th Amendment, and the 26th Amendment. I want to say it once more with feeling. I want an <laughs> ERA, even though I think we already have one in the Constitution. It's called the 14th Amendment. Um, so let's do it again. I, I like the idea. It can give our generation something to mobilize around. So um, when Gandhi was once asked what he thought of Western civilization, he paused. He said, I think it might be a good idea. <laughs> um, and I think uh, the same thing about a right to vote. I think it might be a good idea.
Uh, Elliot. Yeah, let, let, let me ask a question, and I'm sorry we're going to be running out of time. We're going to have to invite you back often. One thing I wish we'd have more time to talk about relates very much to Eric's project, and that is American identity, especially yeah. about immigration. I, like both of you, am, am, am the son of, of immigrants. I did not know that. But uh, let me ask a different question relating to states and the Constitution, which you mm -hmm. talked a great deal about. Mm -hmm. And that is what I would call the problem of the U.S. Senate. You talk about Wyoming, you talk about California. How is it possibly democratic? What does it say about our future? What is just and right about the fact that Wyoming and California have the same number of senators? And when you look at demographic trends, it's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm with you, and indeed the last chapter of this America's Unwritten Constitution puts forth two or three possible um, amendments of the future. And one is direct election of the presidency, although I say you probably don't need a formal amendment, you could do the National Popular Vote Initiative. And I say people, even if they weren't lucky enough, as maybe all three of us were to be born citizens under the Constitution, because that first sentence of the 14th Amendment, Mr. Lincoln's birthday gift to me, See, because when I'm born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, my parents aren't citizens. But because, that, because of Mr. Lincoln's sentence, this, on my a day of my birth, that's a great birthday present, I'm, I'm an American citizen. Um, so another amendment might be those not lucky enough to be born citizens on the day of their birth. If they come here and they contribute to society after 30 years, they should be eligible for the presidency, whether the name is Arnold Schwarzenegger or Jennifer Granholm. So that's the second that I talk about in the last chapter of this book, America's Unfinished Constitution, the Constitution of the Future. But a third is maybe we should change the Senate. No upper house of a state legislature is malapportioned. And remember my three baselines. Amendments should add to liberty and equality. This would add to equality. and. Um, uh, amendments, we should look at state experience. No state has a malapportioned upper house, thanks to Reynolds versus Sims, um, which was presaged by two great Hugo Black opinions, his dissent in Colgrove versus Green and an opinion called Westbury versus Sanders. And third, both parties need to be in favor of it. I think they might be in theory because actually, um, like the, uh, two years ago, the, the, the House actually was controlled by the Republicans and the, the, the Democrats controlled the Senate. So I don't think there's a big systematic skew. Um, I do think it's wrong in principle. Now how do we get there? Why would Wyoming ever agree to this? Because you need two thirds of the existing Senate to vote for it. Three quarters of the existing states. Well, here's where we go back to Mr. Lincoln. We do it in time. Here's what we do. We take, borrow a page from the great political philosopher John Rawls, who asked us to imagine what we would favor if we didn't know what position we had in society, if we were behind a veil of ignorance, trying to figure out what are fair rules for society if we didn't know whether we were at the top of the heap or the bottom. How do we create a veil of ignorance? Here's what we do. We say we're going to propose a constitutional amendment that will go into effect in 100 years. What should be the, uh, the apportionment of the Senate? And now, my, people in Wyoming, think of, you're going to be dead. Um, but the Constitution is about our posterity. You're going to have grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Why should your California great-grandchildren be treated sort of less um, equally, uh, fairly than your Wyoming great grandchildren, because you so so the idea, and maybe you think that just Wyoming is God's special place and it deserves spe extra votes. Because, and if you do, then as a matter of justice, you actually think the the existing rules are right. But we've taken your self interest out of it. We're inviting you to be framers of the future, to try to frame a future world in time, you know, that's better than the world you inherited. And so the idea, I call these, not you've heard of sunset clauses, like the Patriot Act sunsets every t 10 years has to be read up. These are sunrise laws that go into effect after certain, and the framers did that with the international slave trade. They said, we have to compromise it, we have to allow it for the first 20 years, but 20 years from now, we can actually get rid of it. Well, 100 years from now, maybe we could have a differently composed Senate. So that's what I propose as a thought experiment. Well, th that is about as um, inspiring a note to uh, close the formal part of this program as I can think of. This idea that every one of us is a framer of the future. Um, you don't need to have a formal constitutional amendment process for us to 
kind of take that responsibility seriously. And uh, the ways in which uh, uh, Akhil Lamar is, uh, is a badass uh, have to do with uh, the ways in which he seamlessly connects uh, what we're experiencing today, both with the past and with our responsibility to bring to bear civic imagination uh, on the future, that the past uh, is not only not a set of shackles, but the past is far more interesting and rich and surprising uh, if properly mined and explored uh, than we know and can yield far more uh, potential for reimagining uh, the, the civic future. Um, one of our friends, a fellow named Mark Meckler, um, who had been the co-founder of the Tea Party Patriots, uh, now runs an organization called the C uh, Citizens for Self-Governance, uh, is working with a variety of other folks on what you might broadly think of as the right uh, for a movement to organize an Article V constitutional convention. Will they succeed? I don't know. Are the things that they would like to see in a constitu constitutional convention what I'd like to see? Probably not. But the fact of the matter is they are exercising civic imagination in a way that is interesting, that is effective, that is organizing people, that is activating people. Mm -hmm. And like it or not, that's our job here. You know, as Elliot mentioned, if we had another hour and a half with Akil, uh, we would go deeper on the other half of the name of uh, my program here, which is about American identity and thinking about race and immigration and so forth. Uh, but I think so much of what Akil had to say here about us all being the progeny of Lincoln. Uh, also, I invite you, as you step out of this room, walk back into the streets, if you end up going wherever you go, thinking about the moment that we are in. We are 50 years past Selma. We are 50 years past the Voting Rights Act. We are a couple weeks past Baltimore. We are a few months past Ferguson. Uh, we are in an age where uh, there is both progress and retrogression, and an age where the legacies of the past force great and urgent responsibilities upon us right now to think about what do we know, what do we need to know, what do we need to learn and understand, and how can we apply that in how we live as citizens today as better neighbors, as owners of our communities, and as people who help stitch together a bigger story uh, that we share as Americans. So uh, Akhil Lamar embodies everything I've just said in that regard, and we're so grateful, Akhil, uh, that you've joined us. We can continue the conversation as Akhil uh, signs books, uh, which our friends at Politics and Prose will be selling. Uh, and please stick around. I know there's some cookies left over. Uh, and thanks again to all of you, to the incredible team uh, here at the Institute, uh, for getting us together. This actually is the first public event that we've done in my program here, and so there are 101 logistical efforts behind the scenes that the team here uh, made beautiful and seamless, and uh, gratitude to all of you. Thanks for being with us.